and we are live. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, I had some technical difficulties. As you guys can see, I don't have my typical American flag behind me. I'm in a hotel room, and uh, I just had some technical difficulties I needed to solve there before we got going here. Um, so just to kind of get started here, um, I think you guys should all know the two people that are joining me today on stream. Um, to start off here, let me uh, slide in here and get an intro into Sarah Imperial Mike. He is the fantastic author of the guides on the wiki. He has put it together a lot of great information for everyone for FTK1. And he has also put in, I believe it's something like 1,200 plus hours into the game and is a really good community member that helps a lot of beginning players out all the way through Masters. Appreciate, uh, Mike, for you joining me today. And I'm excited hey, for, for this podcast. <laughs> no problem. Um, now to intro Sheldon. I think you guys all know him. He is... <laughs> Not, he disappeared. <laughs> here, here's here's one thing I'm gonna that's not up for debate. People will say, arguably the best player in the game. He or robot is I'm the not best. A robot. <laughs> not a robot. Let's 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 put this in perspective for all you guys. Twenty four hundred hours of gameplay. He has broken the record for most lore ever achieved in FTK at over 100,000 plus. He has the world record of the fastest Masters gameplay of all time. And he is an incredible asset to the community. He helps out so many people and he has poured his heart and soul into this game and has played in total of 100 days straight if he never slept and never ate of this game pretty amazing thank you sheldon so much for joining us today well you did not warn me ahead of time you're gonna put me on the spotlight like that <laughs> holy cow uh, but yes hello <laughs> i am sheldon well <laughs> thank you so much it is a pleasure having you guys back today um of course you guys should all know me I'm GS Daddio. This is my channel, so it'd be weird if you didn't know who I was. Um, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so no intro needed here. Um, just a couple of quick little tidbits for you guys. Um, I am no longer going to be streaming on Twitch. I am going to be doing 100% all my work on YouTube. Um, most of my... Uh, most of my streaming is going to be done on YouTube, or I should say 100% of it is on YouTube, um, but I'm going to be doing a little bit more of different content on YouTube. It's going to be more educational in nature and anything that's kind of um, something that I just want to show you guys. It's not going to be general gameplay. In order for you guys to know when I'm going to go live, I highly recommend for you guys in the comment section, um, check out uh, the Discord. Make sure you guys join there so you know when I'm going to be doing any uh, future content. Um, of course, this is all a surprise. I've been off for the past um, for the past few months and haven't created much content, but I will be coming back. Now, after that long intro, why are we here today? Well, I am really excited about this. So, yours truly did predict that Iron Oaks was working on another project and was not going to be working on DLC for FTK. I believe I predicted this about six months ago, and I think I nailed it exactly right. Yeah, I can confirm you did. Yes. You did. Lo and behold, um, and again, it was a guess. I have no insider information. I'm just a wizard. Okay, so that's just take that. Um, You're an herbalist. <laughs> Herbalist, <laughs> the best intel hero in the game. He, he, he smokes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I like a good God's beard in my pipe. Yeah. Uh, so, um, of course, what they did is just recently uh, they had announced for FTK2. 
Um, I wasn't sure if they were going to do a brand new game entirely, um, but they decided to go with FTK2. And of course, what this brought on is some really good questions in terms of where they're going to take this. And I thought we should definitely have um, Sheldon and Mike on to kind of discuss this. What we're going to do today is <laughs> Richard on here in the yeah. comments says yeah, he's, he, he's more of a golden root guy he, he likes to smoke a good golden root every once in a while so <laughs> you know it sounds like that's got the good gold flakes in there so sometimes that could be a little bit better um but for those of you um uh, why we're here today so what we're going to do is we're just going to we're going to go over four main questions today um but what we're going to do is kind of go in depth and then we're just going to kind of uh brainstorm and kind of talk about where we think this thing is going to go maybe the developers will watch this and actually get some good ideas maybe uh take some of our knowledge and plug it into the new game but i think what makes the most sense to actually start this is start off with a question about what was it about ftk that you liked so much and mike i'd like to start off by asking you this question to start what did they do right with For the King? Yeah. What, what did what, you like? What did they like what did about I like? FTK? Yes. Oh, God. There were so many things I liked about For the King. That's why I've got more than 1,200 hours in it. <laughs> I would say, gosh, one of the main things I really liked about the game, probably, was the chaos timeline mechanic that they built into the game. Because, in my opinion, it was brilliant in what it did. The mechanic... It forced you to progress through the game and not, you know, stagnate and grind for long periods of time, which is one of the things I don't like about many computer games is the, you know, grinding for levels, grinding for gold. It's like, no, we're not going to let you do that. You can grind a little bit, but the more you grind, the more we're going to punish you with mm. that chaos mechanic. So that was one of the things I really, really liked about how For the King was designed. It was brilliant. It was unique. I've never seen it before. And they tied in the chaos mechanic to the storyline. Like, there was a reason why the chaos was was coming down that timeline and was activating and it was affecting the world. So not only did it affect the gameplay, but it also was part of the story as well. That was one of the main things I really liked about the original game. It, it, that's a very interesting point because... Uh... I would agree with you that, that that chaos does give you an opportunity to really push you along in the game. But I think that's the one thing that I think they also did a pretty good job of, too, is the balance of it. Like in apprentice mode, you know, you get a lot more breathing room. Um, so you get more opportunities. So if you're new to the game, you don't feel like that that's crushing you. But it definitely um, was really fascinating to, like, test yourself in master's mode with it going so fast. And also on top of it, too, not only did that mechanic, you know, speed up the game, you also only had so many opportunities to get rid of it, right? There, There's only right. so many things that you can do. Like, where it's kind of funny apprentice mode, you could just do a couple things, but, it, like, you've got to get through the game quickly because there's only so many you can do in a biome, right? There's only, like, one or two opportunities for, to reduce chaos. Like, I get when you open up the next part yeah. of the map, you get six, but... You have to do it pretty quickly. So I think that's you, a very you gotta good move point. on to another biome because you're not gonna be able to remove that chaos. It's yeah. just gonna keep piling up. So it forced you to move on. It's one of the things I really liked about the game. <clears throat> yeah. As you literally said everything so far on that particular topic. That's a main reason why I like for the king too. I like that I'm forced to progress. I like the challenge of it. I don't like to just fart around and just grind endlessly. That's just not fun for me. I mean, I'm sure that's fun for people if they ever, if they do make For the King 2, if they have an option where you can play that way for people who would like to play that way and, and keep the way they're doing it now, the, the Chaos Mechanic way or, uh, or a mechanic similar, that would, that would uh, serve both parties, if, that, if I'm making sense there. Yeah, but actually, if you want to expand on it a little bit, and I think one of the things that I think they did do really well, too, is like with the DLCs, I actually think they give you different types of um, situation. So, for example, um, Frost Adventure actually didn't really have that mechanic. It, you can grind that a lot. Now, they found different ways to make it difficult, like for the fact that it was harder to get herbs and all that kind of stuff with that particular. But I like, I like what the developers tried to do is they tried to make the game different. And try, I think what they were trying to do is testing different things to see kind of how it would work. Um, and definitely, 
I think we would all agree, the Frost Adventure was the easiest because you could grind through it and there was no sense of any type of rush. You could literally play it for as long Make, as you want. Makes perfect sense. If, you have, if every other mode has some type of time restraint and there's one mode that doesn't, then yeah, that one mode that doesn't is going to be the easiest one for sure. Yeah. Okay, so why don't... Uh, do you have some more points that you'd like to talk about? Uh, oh, God, uh, yeah. Well, being an old guy, <laughs> uh, I mean, I grew. what brought me to, to For the King in the first place was just the, the roguelike feel that the game had. Um, it brought back kind of some nostalgia, some of the rogue games I played in my past, which included the original rogue, where the genre was named from. I played rogue, I played NetHack, I played... Um, Wizardry, I played games from the 1980s that uh, kind of led me towards that genre. I, I grew up with D&D, I grew up with GURPS, I grew up with uh, Forgotten Realms, all these things were all kind of uh, leading me to this path. And one of the things I liked about For the King was the way they handled um, uh, characters dying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I like the fact that uh, we, if, if your team's dead, game over. It's permadeath. <laughs> now, no saving. Lot, they gave you a life pool with apprentice difficulty and stuff like that, but when you get to master difficulty, it's, it, it, it feels a lot like those old nostalgic games that I'm used to from, from the long, long past. So that sure. was one of the things I liked about the game as well. Sure. At the... It's kind of funny, Sheldon, you said this real fast, and this kind of popped in my head as you said, no saving. Um, I wish they could find a way to not allow you to save scum. I, I think that's, I, I hope they can find a way to do that, because I think, it's, I think they need to be able to give uh, an opportunity to save, because the game does take a little bit longer than what I would say is some rogues do take. Like, you need to be able to save it and come back to it, because it can take six to eight hours for beginning players to play it. Um, but... The one thing that's kind of interesting, and it depends on how much you want to slice this, this is a little bit of a critique. I don't necessarily call this a roguelike completely, because roguelikes are typically something to where there is no, um, there's no benefit in terms of like, uh, there's no lore and there's no things that actually make the game, quote, easier for you. Um, uh, based off of like things that you can get, like you don't get an opportunity for like grand sanctums and different heroes and all that kind of stuff. But with that being said, I think FTK did do a fantastic job also with the fact that I don't think the lore or like getting new characters, except for Gladiator, uh, to a certain degree, was the only thing that really made it like that much easier. I don't think it made the game that much easier. I think there was like nice little neat things about it, but it didn't like overpower it to where like you got like this lore and it just made it really really easy and i think they did a good balance i think between those two things i would agree their lore store in unlocking uh extra classes new events stuff like that that just made the game more interesting it didn't really make the game unbalanced or anything uh, now, there is, we will talk about later on, in fact, probably right after we're done talking about this topic on what actually was broken about the game, what made the game unbalanced. You know, we'll get there, but yeah. Yeah. But it definitely wasn't the lore store yeah. when it comes to balancing. Yeah. You, you know, I thought the lore store was great. I liked, I liked the idea of um, rewarding you for gameplay, rewarding you for playing the game. So a lot of the things that they did with the lore store, like they they would reward you with things you could unlock in the lore store by playing a different uh, game mode, for example. Play Hildebrand Cellar, and hey, we'll unlock some things. True. Play uh, you know, Into the Deep, and you can unlock a special character. So they kind of rewarded you by actually playing the game. But that was another thing in general that I liked about For the King is um, it gave me the feel of those old role-playing games like D&D and GURPS, where I would have a dungeon master or a game master who would, you know, give a quest to the party, and the party would go off on that quest. And as much as that dungeon master or game master wanted to control what the party would do, it was complete chaos. The party goes off and does whatever it wants. And you could essentially do the same thing in For the King. You had a main quest line, just like a dungeon master giving you a main quest line. But then you can run off and do side quests. You could, your party completely split up and do crazy things and get themselves killed. 
which often happens when playing role-playing games. <laughs> so it actually gave me a, a really good role-playing feel in a computer game, which was really, really cool. That's what I liked about it. And, oh, another thing I really, really liked about For the King is their whole concept of the focus pool as a resource. Uh. <laughs> um, that mechanic, I thought, was brilliant. Because a lot of things that you see in computer games, like if you take a spellcaster class or you take a melee character class like a spell ca a spellcaster will typically have like a mana bar or a magic bar as a resource that would deplete mm -hmm. but that particular resource was mostly useless to a melee character and the melee character would have some other kind of resource like adrenaline or blood rage or who knows what they found a way to give you a depletable resource that can be used for either class magic users or melee characters uh, that would need to be replenished over time. And it affected, it helped you to help control the RNG, the, the randomness sure. of, of the game. So, yeah, it, yeah. so it, it ended up being a strategic aspect of the game, you know, strategically deciding when do I really need to make sure that this roll hits? You know, like when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons and you're rolling 10 sided dice, it's like you're at the complete mercy of the dice. It's like, I really, really need to get this critical hit. And like, no, you get a critical fail. But, you know, with the focus, it's like, I, you know, I'm about to die. I really got to get this roll. You can actually say, I'm going to guarantee I get this roll right now and use the focus. And the, I thought that was a brilliant mechanic in For the King. I want to make, I want to see that extended and brought into For the King too. I think that they would be crazy to not include that. I definitely have a, a follow-up question to focus, but I kind of, Sheldon, what, what do you think about the whole focus mechanic? What did you think about that in FTK? I mostly like that they had some way to counter RNG, like Mike stated. I, for one, don't like, but I, I'm weird like this. I love games with randomness, but I also don't like the randomness, just I'm at the mercy of it. So I I'm, I'm, I'm kind of counterdicting myself here. So I like games in which you can control the randomness somewhat. Yeah, and for the king does this with focus, and like Mike said, if you really want to, like, let's just say you have a play style, and whatever that play style is, you want to make sure that play style works, and that play style only you only use in certain situations. You can use like you can use your focus for that particular situation, so that you can make sure that the randomness doesn't really screw with you too much when you're trying to do some type of theme in your game. If yeah. that makes sense, I really like focus for that reason as well. I think. Um... Honestly, I, I think focus is probably, I mean, of course, it's like the major mechanic of the game. I, the chaos timeline is another um, really important aspect to, you know, we, we've done videos and we've talked a lot about pathing and all that kind of stuff, how important that is. But focus, I think, is one of the most um, probably mismanaged aspect to the game, I think, probably to most players and probably why they don't even realize they're struggling with the game. I I do feel like there's a tendency of people that sit there and just like spam focus when they don't really understand that just like hammering focus all the time is not a very good use of it. And I think a lot of people do. They're, they're, they, there's a community member uh, probably watching the video right now that I, I had a discussion about focus and what they're doing is they're always saving it for the perfect time. And it's like, stop saving it for the perfect time. Like, what, it, what is the perfect time? Do you even know? That's exactly. And if you're dead, there's no perfect time. Um, yeah. You're, you're dead. <laughs> right. Um, and I think that's the hard balance. Now, for me, it comes very naturally because um, I sometimes, I would say a little bit overuse it to a certain degree. Um, but because of my math skills, like I know like the benefit and the risks of like when to use it, not to use it. But I have just a general question to before we... Uh, before I kind of talk about what I what I like about it is, would you guys be a hundred percent opposed to if they completely eliminated the whole focus mechanic in FTK too? Do you think it does? Do you think it completely changes the game? I think it does completely change the game. I think it's one of the things that made the game fun okay. and unique and unique unique in, the, in 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 any game I've ever seen. Um, I, I would think. They they would be crazy to to not bring that over into For the King too. Now if they choose to get rid of it and they choose to replace it with something else, 
Okay, well, we'll have to see what that is. <laughs> I'm fine but... if they replace it with something else. If there's a mechanic that's, that does the same thing as Focus or really darn close, they could call it something different to give a little spice to it, and I would be fine with it. If there's if they added some way to control the randomness just like Focus did, and for the King 2, even if it's not called that, it's called something else that everyone can use, I'd be fine with it. If they took If they took that out of the game, I'm not sure how I would feel about it, they would have to add some other part of the game that I'm not thinking of to somehow make up for the lack of focus or or a, a copycat of it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I agree. They should expand on it rather than try to remove it. Yeah. And it's it's aptly named, right? When you want to get something, you want to you want to get a perfect hit. You're gonna focus really really hard to make sure you get that perfect hit. If they named it appropriately. Great, great name. Like, yeah. It was a great name. It was a great concept. Uh, they would be crazy to not include it in For the King 2. I would agree. In, in my opinion. I, I would agree with Richard. I I think it kind of shell and saying this to a certain degree, too, just in a different way, is expanding on it. Like, maybe it changes, like, ever so slightly in maybe how it's used or how you get it or something like that. But I I do like the focus mechanic, too. And I, I hope they don't change Because I actually, and we're, we'll go through a couple of these other questions. I think there's other things that they can improve upon. I think the focus should be kind of something that kind of is a staple that probably should sit around, but maybe has a minor tweak to it to liven it up maybe a little bit. Um, uh, let me, is that, are those pretty much the main things that you liked about FTK? Among other things. I mean, there were plenty <laughs> of things that I liked about it. One of the things I really liked about it is that gold actually mattered. I can't tell you how many times I've played a game where you either get so much gold that the gold is absolutely meaningless, mm -hmm. or you don't get enough gold so you can't buy the things you want. Yeah. They, they, they actually found a really good balance where gold actually mattered. It wasn't so completely impossible to get that you couldn't buy what you wanted, but it also was to a point where like you couldn't buy everything either. It's like you were always like, I need a little bit more gold because I really, really want to get that. And it, it really kind of created a drive that made the game fun. It adds decision making, which is huge. Yeah. It adds another form of decision making. I think a great game, a game like this, if you can give the player more options to decide on what they want to do, because you can't just do everything, mm -hmm. then it really adds strategy to the game. Yeah. And For the King has loads of strategy in the game. Even. When, even when you know all the OP stuff, there's still instances of the game where you have to make decisions. And the gold really helps out with that. Yeah, and I, I, I actually think those are all really good points. Yeah, um, they found a good balance. Okay, so let's kind of finish off this question. So is there anything in particular that you feel like you want to share, Sheldon, about what you really liked about FTK before I share my thoughts on it real quick? I'm, if there is, I'm sure they'll come up as you begin talking, if okay. there is anything else. So go ahead. <laughs> okay, so, like, so my main thing is, is how I, I mean, of course, we're all going to be biased in terms of the way that we like to consume a game. I think this game really perfectly balanced, first off, both the difficulty and the length of the game. And what I mean by that is, I feel like a lot of these roguelike games make the hardest difficulty like stupidly impossible like it's just like it's kind of like if, if there's um and i don't want to be calling out any particular games but there's one game in particular where they had a mode where it was like they pretty much just like quadrupled the amount of like enemies that are running at you it, it just like turned into like you're just hope and pray that you could get through it and it was just kind of like ridiculous at one point but i think really it took a good knowledge of the game to be able to play masters and beat masters but at the same time as to i think it's like in the realm of people being able to do it and i think um i think that's what really worked well for it but i also liked how long the games were for a person such as myself i don't like really really short games I only take like an hour or two um sheldon you don't count because you're going through the game so fast at two and a half hours to beat it in masters you're not a normal player <laughs> but so um but with that being said i like the fact that normal games you know and i think mike you alluded to this a little bit ago um uh off off topic or uh at another time like some of the beginning players take some about eight to ten hours to play the game 
you know, for me, I do play it at a much slower pace, and I kind of like it that way. I like being able to play four to five hours, and I think that's good because I feel like it's long enough to where you feel like you're invested in it, uh, but at the same time, is too, you don't feel like, like, I love Divinity Original Sin. I think that's a great game, but that's like, the game just takes days and days and days and days and days and days, and it's nice to be able to kind of, like, retry it and keep, like, finding the better nuances about the game to be able to master it and i think that's what i really i think both of those things was really well put together in ftk one yeah i agree that the, the length of the game was was uh was a selling point as well you could actually sit down with a, a co-op group of friends and in one day or you know one session just hammer out a game yeah you yes. know the better you got the faster you could do the games <laughs> like sheldon down to two hours i think i could probably do a game pretty comfortably in four hours new people i think when you first start playing the game 10 hours eight to 10 hours is probably pretty normal sure but it can still be done in a day right so yeah, yeah i agree with that mm -mm. and so why don't we kind of then like dovetail into the big que uh, question number two uh for today um so let's get into the meat of this let's start really talking about ftk2 and oh, yes, you know, and I've been talking a lot about one. So yeah. What do I want to see for the King Two bringing okay. to the, to the so. table? For God's sakes, give us a sandbox. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they'll give it to us, but and to <laughs> and I apologize if I mispronounce this, but uh, Toker Toker, this is actually something like he puts in there about he would like to see more drawn out combat, um, leading to more use of buffs and support skills. And you know, we're actually going to talk about the fights in a different question. Um, but let's talk about what improvements uh, we would like to see um, from FTK to FTK2. And I'll start off this particular one. And I, I actually have three kind of in general. Um, and the first one is more than likely, I would say probably the most important of the three is there was too much emphasis on speed being the most important aspect to the game. And once we kind of found that out, it kind of unfortunately locked you into um, certain heroes. And you know, if you picked other ones, you were just kind of purposely nerfing yourself. Um, it, you were just doing it as a challenge. You know, we joke a lot about Triple Treasure Hunter to be that like particular <laughs> pick. And um, it's not that necessarily I think they should change speed in terms of like how it impacts combat um because i actually think there's some very clever ways that they can um, improve upon it like for instance um we've debated a lot about like you know awareness hero um those weapons are really like not the greatest well why don't you have to where like the only type of equipable items that you have um you need to have 78 awareness and those particular equipable items actually increase your speed so what you're doing is you're literally selecting awareness because it's the fastest, and what you're doing is wanting to hit a lot with a very, like, maybe low damage, low ability type weapon, whereas, like, you know, let's say, you know, the Scholar never gets that opportunity to do it, but the Scholar has, like, the best over, or I shouldn't say the Scholar, the Intel has the better opportunity to, um, you know, can do, like, resets and rushes, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of the resets and rush stuff um, at some point, but I... I want to see them put a little bit more focus on, um, no pun intended, put more focus on abilities. Um, and I would like to see more of just like, I'd be cool if they just set every single hero at 68 speed. And just don't, what it is, is like it's all important to where like maybe abilities like play off of each other or there's different ways that the team kind of meshes together and those different types of combinations. I'd like to see a little bit more of that. I don't, I just don't like that the speed stat became pretty much it trumped everything else. And and I think that was a, a pretty big weakness in FTK one. I can yeah, see by your face, Mike, you have something to say. <laughs> I, I understand where where he's coming from, but speed speed was so integral to so many aspects of the game that it became like super important and and, and overpowered in a sense. Um but if you're going to like level set everybody's speed to be the same for the characters as a baseline, I feel like what you're doing really is creating a generic like 
if I if I go like to my my days playing role playing games and building characters in like D and D or GURPS or something, we would start out with a uh, a base ten in every stat, and then we would have attribute points, and with attribute points we could buy up certain stats to kind of essentially create your own character in the mold that you want your character to be. So you know, base sixty eight speed, and then if you want to have a faster character, then, you know, give you some sort of currency that you could use to increase the speed of a character. And the more you buy that attribute, the more expensive it becomes of that limited pool of attribute points that you have to spend. I've seen games that had that do this. Um, I played GURPS. Oh, sorry, not GURPS. Um, Guild Wars. Guild Wars on uh, from way back. The, not Guild Wars 2, but Guild Wars the original. They had attribute points that you could spend into different attributes, and I could kind of see uh, that you could actually create a, a whole customizing aspect to your characters rather than a, a, a cookie-cutter template that's simply given to you. Guild Wars is an interesting example, it, mostly because of what Daddio said. Daddio said he wants the abilities to have some type of appearance that actually matter, but it I mean, it's hard to have the abilities shine if stats trump them. So if all the stats are the same, then the next thing to look at are 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 um passive skills or 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 any type of skill really. Like I know in Guild Wars, like you said, everything is the same stat range, and Guild Wars was all about your skills, which is in this case uh the passives and skills and and for the king, it's very similar, I think. So yeah, it, it, you could pick you could uh, pick classes to really use their their actual abilities rather than having to rely solely on an OP stat. And in this case, it was speed yeah. for the king one. Yeah, I'd like to just see a little bit more nuance to it, to where you have to think a little bit more about you know what you're selecting is all. Like one of the things I think they, they could improve upon is just bringing in the other attributes, the other stats that you don't typically use, right? So if you have a scholar, you're never going to use their strength stat unless, unless you're really forced into a bad situation. But, you know, imagine if they were to, to, to make those other stats more meaningful for all the characters. Let's say, you had, let's say you had weapons where there were different abilities on those weapons that used different stats. So you could have a staff, and that staff could do an intelligence attack, that staff could also do a physical melee attack using strength or something. You could you could actually have weapons that have different uh, skills in them that op, that work off of different stats. Yeah, I think, but I think that the main point is is when we talk about the battles, though, is like you can have those different things because you know Intel had the best type of weapons, but like it's still like depending on the mixture and stuff like that. I just think that speed was just still too important. It was just like because you want to be able to attack more than anybody else. And I, I think, um, and it, this kind of goes to a much, much smaller point. I don't know if luck was just an afterthought or something, but like luck and vitality were almost like irrelevant too. Like it had like no bearing on the game at all. So I don't, right. I, I don't know. Like, that, I, I just think the stats needed to be a little bit more thought about um, just in general. And I think that's why they're developing For the King too. It's like they kind of gave it their first go with For the King. And they're like, okay, there's areas that we can improve, and they want to do it right. They want to actually give it an opportunity to improve some of those areas. So I agree with you. Luck stat wasn't hardly used. You could definitely bring luck into into the gameplay a lot, lot more. Yeah. Um, and make some of those other stats more meaningful, for sure. I mean, Sheldon, like, any thoughts about, like, them making such a focal point on speed, would you like to see them adjust that a little bit more? Well, I was thinking speed is mostly important because you want to be super aggressive in For the King 1. That's really what you want. You want to go more offense than you do defense. I dare say you kind of want to do that for any game. Every game I played, offense always seemed to trump defense. It just seems to be it just seems to be a gaming thing. It's just offense always beats defense. And speed helps with that. If you can go faster, you can kill faster. So, yeah. Um, unless if they somehow make defensive on par with offensive, I don't know how you would do that, but let's just say that's possible. <laughs> if they can make defense tactics just as good as offense tactics, <laughs> and even then speed is still important because speed will still allow you to do defense and offense quicker. 
I, so no matter what, speed is a problem. I, yeah. I, I think sh what Sheldon is saying to the developers, try to bring defense on. I'll still find a way to be more offensive. It doesn't matter what you try to throw at me. <laughs> That makes me think about um, what I what they might have had in mind when they were originally designing the game, like the blacksmith. The blacksmith had a, a, a ability called Steady, where I almost felt like the blacksmith was designed to be the prototypical tank mm -hmm. that you would normally see in these types of games. And so that was their attempt to build a character that could do a tanking role. So with Steady, you completely negate all the damage that he takes now you throw in taunt so that he can direct all the enemies to try to attack him and he uses steady to essentially absorb all that damage that was their initial attempt at trying to create a tanking kind of role in the game i feel like in the end it just didn't quite work the way they really wanted it to but this gives me a lot of excitement for where for the king 2 may be going because they're it looks like they're changing the way the combat system is going to but, work. But don't 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 jump ahead to one of my questions yet. Just just oh, hold is that off. One of your questions? Yeah, just hold off on that. <laughs> just hold off on that. Hold off. We'll we'll, we'll get to that point. Um. Okay. So it, there's uh there's two more points um that I I have on uh some improvements and one of this I think is low hanging fruit for the game and I actually think no matter what they do it's going to be an improvement leveling up was irrelevant in this game it was just irrelevant like it did not matter that you got one level higher it, it just so you did one more damage literally the best thing about leveling up was timing it so you could heal yourself that's what leveling up was good for that that like was free it, heal. it doesn't <laughs> yeah it didn't do anything to the yeah, game you, you gain one extra point of damage you gain about three to four hit points of max health. Yeah, it, it, that, that's really all you're getting from it. I totally agree with you that the leveling system could definitely get a buff. I would say, you know, you could you could throw that into weapons, right? You can give a special attack ability on a weapon that you have to be a specific level to be able to use it, mm -hmm. for example. Give you a reason to want to get to a level. I, I think, though, they can... This is where I go back to the abilities aspect of the game. And... Um, what I would love to see is like, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about like, you know, certain heroes, again, going back to like the awareness um, hero, but like, what if you had some really cool, like stacked abilities? So let's say like, um, you know, traditionally you had called shot with, um, with the awareness hero, but what if there was called shot two, like when you get to level three and it's like, it does some really cool stuff with the bow. Like it like automatically resets, like, the enemy as well too when you when he hits his called shot and all of a sudden what you start looking at is like well wait a minute here because now when you talk about the different nuances of like the weaponry and all that kind of stuff now what you're doing is you're also factoring another like complexity to it to where you sit there and go like let's say scholar for instance we say scholar is one of the best and but what if like the leveling up the scholar was kind of crappy and you sit there and go but some of these other ones have some cool leveling up to do so we're like certain heroes are very sh strong early on but become weaker compared to others like when you get to level three and level six and such real quick uh when you mentioned call shot that reminds me of something i didn't like about call shot specifically uh the way they did it is crit uh, call shot supposed to be basically a chance to just get a crit well what i didn't like is for whatever reason they made it that if you use the focus mechanic it turns off your passive and that's not clear to everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's punishing yourself. It's very similar to Justice, too. They have a mechanic, crit chance, which literally counters your own passive skill. It's like, or, or it's a competition with it. It's, a, it's, com it's competing with it, which is yeah. not good. Yeah. If you, uh, get a crit, if you get a crit, then your Justice can't go off. Exactly. If you so, get Justice, then a crit can't happen. <laughs> I, I, would, I would feel if they add... If they redo the skills they already have or make new ones, to not limit the skill by using another mechanic combined with it. Like they should, everything should stack together. There should, they should be separate. And if they are going to be separate, make it really clear to the player that they're separate. Because no one knows that if you... Hardly anyone knows if you focus, that call shot doesn't go off. Mm -hmm. Right? Who would know that? No one would know that. Yeah, and you, you, and you would be nerfing yourself the whole time. Not, hardly anyone knows that your crit chance... Uh, is checked before justice. 
Like no one knows that. But, yeah, but you're nerfing yourself. Like if you like if you wanted to do pure damage as your main strategy as a woodcutter, you're literally nerfing yourself. You're nerfing the justice skill. So let me uh, yeah. Let me ask you. <laughs> let me ask you a follow up question to that. So I the one thing I found very strange about the gladiator and why I thought the gladiator there's so many things about the gladiator that made him OP, but one of the big things was is glory. So glory procs before you even take your you fight. Like so before you actually take your turn in battle. Before you even target before you even target your enemy. But called shot, justice, like it, go down the list, they all happen after the fact like you don't know what's going to happen so do you think more of the abilities should have procced prior like glory or afterwards like called shot like take away the fact that focus screwed it up let's say focus didn't screw it up what would you would you rather it be afterwards so it's a surprise or would you rather it be on the front end of it um i'm actually fine with it either occurring before or occurring after okay I, just, I can't think of a. Sorry, I can't think of a reason why it matters. Oh, wait, um, it makes a much. huge difference. Yeah, it, it does make a huge difference because you, for example, if glory goes off, you suddenly know you have the capability to one shot something. Yeah, whereas you it's might have not have been able to before. See, oh well, oh, well in glory in glory's in case, uh, yeah, but like, yeah, so, I see, well, I'm not gonna. Call shot, you're gonna get the crit. So do I? Do I target something that I know I don't have enough maximum damage to kill? But if I crit, I would. Okay, never mind. You guys, you guys, are, really know. You guys are right. It's actually a, a huge. It's a lot of info that you gain if it yeah, is. Yeah, I, yeah. Honestly, I think, my apologies. Yeah. That, that's another reason why I put Gladiator so far above everything else because he gets that stupid chance to like. He gets that twenty-five percent increase. I think it's twenty-five percent increase, and you know he's getting it. So now you could kill a high HP target. It, like, it completely actually changed my battle perspective. But then when Justice goes off, it always ends up being something that was like a 1 HP target that I was just hoping to finish off anyways because I couldn't kill something else. And then you're just like, damn it. I know Justice is supposed to be Splash, so that's probably not the greatest example. But Called Shot, like for instance, it's like, it, it's like Gladiator has become that much better. Now, I kind of am okay that it should have been on the back end, so it's kind of a surprise, but I didn't like that it was a mixture. I didn't like that, like, some characters, that he had it over everyone else, but that's that's kind of some, that's like a small thing that I'd like to see changed with them. But I think leveling up definitely is something they can improve upon. The, the thing about that, Daddy, is that no one passive is equal in value to another passive. They all have, there's all, they're always going to, you can always create a ranking system of what's passive is better than another. But if you, and so, and so I don't often like to compare them apples to apples. It's like, I, I will take the passive as it is, and it's built into that character, and I will evaluate that character for what it has. Well, this goes back to my discussion, though, if the speed was the same <clears> for everything right i would then evaluate the abilities over that so if you if you had a choice between like called shot and justice and all that i'd pick glory because glory i know when it's going to go off i think that's way overpowered powered so that's why i would then judge it off of that but i'd like to see more abilities that intertwine with each other but let me let me go on to my third thing that i'd like to see and this is more of a ask for i would say the 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 community that's been a part of FTK for a, like a while and to kind of spice up the game for a little bit. I like to see the developers more involved in doing buffs and nerfs to the game. Um, I think if they would have like changed up like different weapons or added different weapons or added, you know, different types of gear or did different things to maybe balance like where we talk about how we think Scholar is, you know, definitely above and beyond everyone else. I would have liked to have seen Scholar nerfed a little bit and Herbalist, you know, buffed a little bit. I would like to have seen a little bit of the developers getting more involved in terms of tweaking things to where it wouldn't have really made a large impact, I would say, on the beginning players, but would have made things, like, changed it up and spiced up the game a little bit more for the people that have been playing it for a lot a while. Building off that, if the, if the designers are going to constantly rebalance the game or tweak the game, you're going to have updates coming on a fairly regular basis, right? Mm-hmm. 
So if you're going to have that kind of back and forth between Iron Oak and their playing community, downloading more content, you know, updates, bug fixes, whatever it is, right, then take advantage of the fact that you're going to have that kind, of, that kind of communication going back and forth. One of the things I would love to see is um, an achievement board that you can, you know, see where you stand with everybody who's playing the game from around the world. Oh, that reminds me. Um, what goes along with that is some type of like daily or weekly weekly challenge, like a re like something that make that excites me to play uh, some more, even when I've already completed the game. Like there are some people that they will hundred percent the game, and well, I've already did everything, so I guess I'll just leave, and only the hardcore fans will stay and play, right? Like I feel like if you, I wanna have something where even if you've completed everything that like, there's still something to earn like maybe there's daily challenges that and weekly challenges that always rewards you and rewards you something that you don't already have which would which goes along with the developers um doing regular updates i don't know how much of a hassle that is but if they were willing to do that they could constantly make the game fresh and people who really like the game still have reasons to play the game without having to do what I do and just make up content by doing the most absurd challenges imaginable. That's how I entertain myself. <laughs> like <laughs> No, I think I think that's a I think that's a really good improvement. I, I think yeah. that's and I think that kind of just like all kind of combines with, you know, being a little bit more active in like the community and just like creating some of those kind of fun challenges. I, I think that that's a really good idea. Um so, yeah, but I, I mean, I like the idea of having a daily challenge that they can introduce, or a weekly challenge, having a uh, a, a le um, like I said, a, like a leaderboard or something where you can actually uh, compare yourself to how you're doing against other people playing the game. A statistics, a statistics board would be cool. Yeah, it would be really cool at the end of the game to be able to have a list of all the enemies I killed. How many beastmen did I kill? How many sea hags did I kill? You know, it's like I want to see. You know, oh my god, I didn't realize I killed three hundred enemies during that game. You know, <laughs> steps did I take? No, you know, silly stuff like yeah, having, having a way to look at the statistics at the end of the game. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> or and then and then imagine if you had like uh, special events that would occur, like after you've killed ten uh merlings during your game you get uh a merling ambush or you know comes it comes after you it's like hit you the, the, race, the race is angry at you and so it sort of spawns an event within the game you know <laughs> it's completely dependent upon you know what you're literally doing in the game you know i i'm also chuckling to the fact of having actually an end game log because i don't attack anybody after glittering mine so my end game log would just have nothing in it it would just be me just going directly to the end of the game it's pretty well, as, a statistic board would be would be a great way to once you've done everything like if you wanted to create challenges for yourself like i already do like well okay let's see i completed the game in, in 100 steps like can I beat the game taking 70 steps? Or, you know, or just take any stat in the statistics. Like, can I do it with this? Or yes. can I do it with this? Like, you know. That, that, for, 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 for players who are like that, anyways. For, for me personally, that, I, would, I would do that. That's a good point. <laughs> okay, so th those were my kind of improvements. I know Sheldon just kind of said a couple improvements. Mike, anything in particular that you have? You know, I'd like to see them do more with the towns in the game. Like expand on that. Right now, I, I, yeah, yeah, I could just, I could just go to the town, do whatever I want to do in the towns. Like, what, what if that town was under siege, like in, like in Frost Adventure, where you have to clear it? What, what if, what if, like, an event spawns on your timeline, and that timeline's like, once it falls off, one of the towns somewhere on the, on the board is going to get sieged, where it's not going to be something you go to and instantly use the inn or something like that. You have to fight enemies to clear it out. So you're literally defending the realm and, and clearing the town so, you know, things are happening. Uh, you know, imagine if you had, like, a, 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 a camp of scamps or a camp of thieves, and if you let that camp sit there and you don't go vanquish it, it has a chance to raid the town and, and, and you know, invade it cause you so that you can't just go in there and, and be able to use the services because it's been invaded or something like that. Sure. This is actually 
something very interesting that Richard just actually just popped up in here. He, they would like to see a rework of the Scourge mechanic. Or Can, maybe, maybe not necessarily, necessarily a, 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 repli- a, a re- rework of it, but add to it. Can, like, Scourge is just like a random boss appears somewhere in the world. You could do other things. You could do events that occur. Show me your ideas. I just, it just, yeah, I had a thought just popped in my hands, a little spitball idea. Uh, it looks like that the plot for For the King 2 has something to do with being rebels against Rosmon. It's what it looks like. So what I was thinking is... The Mad Queen. Well, yeah. So I was thinking, well, what if you had, like, a, like two different things on the timeline, or maybe three. Like, you have a Chaos, you have the Scourges, and then you have this other one, like a bounty or a reputation mm. because like let's for example let's say, let's say it's a bounty and every time a bounty comes up you have like a increased chance to get uh, ambushed by royal guards every time you visit a town because Roswan wants you right Roswan wants to kill the rebels and every time you visit the town the guards see you oh there they are and i you know I'll get randomly ambushed by freaking royal guards in a town or something that would be interesting. Yeah. As a, oh god, that yeah. reminds me. I, I want. I want to have some use for lore beyond simply buying stuff in a lore store. They gotta find a way to make lore something that you could spend during the game to improve your gameplay or improve the things that occur in the game. Not just farm it. Not just farm it for no reason. Guy with a hundred k lore. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll, you know what's so funny with the whole FTK2 thing? I never even thought about the Scourges. It's funny to rework the Scourge mechanic. I, I would be so fine with them just deleting Scourges. I find them so pointless. It's just annoying. Like, I find it not... I don't actually think it provides actually, much value. No, I, no, I, no, I, I completely disagree. disagree. Yeah, Daniel, I actually... I just read for yeah. So <laughs> that has to do with your skill level, probably. So if you're a new player, every single scourge is probably going to be a pain in the ass to deal with. And, but yeah, but I'm guessing there's about, let me guess half the scourges in the game you don't even care about. Well, I think like, I think <laughs> the scourges come down to like it's what I really hated about um, Into the Deep. It it's just like. They're just randomly somewhere in the map, and you hope to find it, but you've already are dealing enough with timeline issues and all that kind of other stuff. Like, I feel like you just hope that you run into a scourge, and if you don't, you just wait by a cult device. So when it pops up, it just then dies. Like, I just, I think the rework makes sense. Like, I, when you guys talked about like bounties and all that kind of stuff, yeah, get rid of scourges and do like bounties and stuff like that. Like, I'd be totally. I think I'd be way happier about it. I just didn't like how scourges are done. Well, if, you're, if your main issue is you just don't know where the scourges are, if they made a way where you can find out, like, a, I don't know, a, some, some type of scroll that just shows you where they are. I don't know, but then, like, some of the scourges were so stupid anyways. Like, Demos just had crystals floating around the map. Like, I'm just like, I, the only thing that ever, like, literally scared the bejesus out of me was, like, a level 10 freaking uh, Jester, like that thing, made me crap my pants because you have to make sure that thing's gone. Like, but other everything else was kind of like, you know, what was even funny the one that like gets rid of um the the sanctums. I'm kind of like I'll still beat the game anyways. I don't really care if you get rid of my sanctums. Like I was it because that was still work. I still feel like that opinion is because of your skill level though. Yeah. Because I think I have the same thought as you. I also don't care about the scourges, but that's because of my skill level. Like, with my current skill level, there are certain scourges you just don't care about. They just don't affect you. Well, Keanu Man does nothing. The disciple doesn't really do anything. Uh, yeah, the, the Final Priestess, yeah, you, she breaks sanctums, but as long as you don't die, then who cares? Sure. Like, yeah. I, so I, I, I partially agree with you. Okay. But I also partially disagree with you. Thinking as a casual player, like... I bet I bet you there are play styles where the Volcano Man blocking like people who just walk around on land masses constantly, Volcano Man would be pain in the butt. Okay. And, but because we, but because of the way we play and we always say go on a boat, Volcano Man is you can ignore it. So yeah, it, I mean, do you have any input on Scourge's Mike on that? I mean, I'm like, 
half like not really. No, okay. I'm I'm fine with the scourges as they were. If they if they decide to change it up with for the king two, that's fine. But okay. um, I, I'm not heavily invested in it. So <laughs> well, that'd be the problem. Like it, they're just they're just there. Because the, the, <laughs> the next couple of questions are going to be uh what we've actually seen about FTK two. Um, but before I head on any other improvements you guys would like to see before we move on from that question. Uh, Mike, you were going to tell us something about Blacksmith. Are, are we, is that relevant now? Remember, you said, you told Mike to not talk about Blacksmith Steady for some reason? Or I was getting to, I was talking about Blacksmith when we were about to approach the whole combat system, and I think that's... Uh, we're just getting there? Yeah, we're yeah. just getting to that now? Okay, so let's, okay. let's okay. get into, of course, all this is speculation, but that there is... <laughs> Two things that we know about FTK from the screenshots and Steam. So anyone FTK who's too. any anyone who's watching this, all we've got this information from is legitimately just from the screenshots of FTK2 on the Steam link. So if you guys want to check out the Steam link, it's actually in the description. Um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, and just scroll through the photos. You'll see what we we see. But the big thing is the new battle system. Um, and the new battle system is the two by four grid um of course we don't know how it's all gonna go we don't know if there's a general timeline but mike why don't you kind of tell us what you kind of think about it and what you kind of foresee or any kind of concerns or what you're excited about with the two by four system when i first thought my first thought was oh they're trying to fix the tank they're trying to fix their original idea for the blacksmith where you know they wanted a tank who could get out front and, and absorb the damage but when it was just a straight up line that was done in for the king it you know they had to taunt the the attacks to them to make it work and they were so slow, they wouldn't be able to taunt until after the enemy already attacked. It just didn't work out quite the same way. It looks like physical positioning is now going to be more important with the combat system, where you could put the more armored, more vitality-type healthy character in the front lines to take those attacks that come and keep your weaker spellcaster types in the back line and so they actually have that tanking role more traditional that's what it looks like to me sure and i'm actually kind of excited to see if that's how it plays out i'm gonna so with the new stuff i'm gonna play a lot of devil's advocate here um so just to kind of make our brains stir a little bit on this um so again with the game like the speed in which you play the game, you know, Sheldon, of course, you get through the game very quickly. Is there any concerns that you have about likely what my assumption is going to be is you need to set up your battle formations, you know, before the battle starts, right? That, you, that was my only concern. Are we worried about it slowing down the game too much to where uh. it's, it's going to like, you sit there and you're trying to plug it away, especially if you're playing with three other people, you're talking about, should I put this person here, or put that person there? And like, do you think it can actually bog this game down to a certain Possibly, point? Uh, depending on what they do. I think, yes. That I think that you, if there's a template on how you want you guys to go in battle, I think that needs to be determined before you go into battle. I don't think it's a good idea to have that decision starting every battle. Like you go into a battle, okay, to decide where you want your guys to be. Doing that every single time will slow the game down too much. I think that they should have a pre-built, a, a, a template that you build that is always the same going in, just to keep the battle quick. Otherwise, you're constantly having to um, strategize where to place your characters down. Maybe it's not as slow as I'm thinking, but to me, it might be make that might make the game a little bit too slow. I don't know. That's my thoughts on that. To, like, a concern. Now I'm being like, de devil's advocate to the devil's advocate, though. It's like if you have a predetermined <laughs> set, and it's really important where you position your players, what if the enemies are not set in the same position to where you then technically really need to think about in each different battle, you really need to make sure. Or it, here's, here's something else that may happen. Do you think that maybe the map, 
how the overworld is actually does determine where the enemies come in. Like, does it depend on, like, depth, how far away they are? That that's actually going to determine the placement on the battlefield? Or is it just going to be a random placement when those handful get sucked into it? Well, so, so if we know, mm-hmm. if, you're new, if you're new to the game, which we're all going to be, <laughs> and even in real life, if you're engaged in combat, mm-hmm. and, you, and, and you both see each other, do you both get to just sit around and position yourselves correctly? Well, this is a video game. Even then, it's a video game, but you know, like, it's a turn-based video game. It's just like, at, even, I, mean, I mean, you still want some type of realism in the game. You don't want it to be completely ridiculous. I mean, do you? Do you? It's not no. like you did. No, but like, okay, yeah. like. <laughs> okay, so again, I'm purposely just being devil's advocate just to try to yeah. get some more talking points about this. But like, I, th- I think it's going to be cool. I think it's going to be very interesting to set it up. I know there's... um. Uh, oh, and I should have plugged this at the very beginning of the the podcast. I apologize, Mike, for not doing this. You have a suggestion box in there, um, and so I don't want to like steal your your talking point. You put you put something in there about AOE. Like, how is AOE going to be impacted now? Like, is AOE going to be more important now? Is AOE going to be kind of hit or miss with how things are, like how the enemies are grouped together? Like, how is that going to work? I actually think. I don't know because uh, I was already thought about that. They've already I would got hope that so. in mind. A hundred percent. It's like you have a, a a two by four grid, so four across on the front line, four across on the back line. When it comes to using an AOE attack, if it's a spell, for example, you're probably going to be not able to hit the entire grid. You're probably going to be able to hit four of those squares out of the total of eight. Sure. So you could choose to do the four front line, all four in the front line, or all four in the back line. Or maybe you could choose to do a square. Mm-hmm. I could do a square in the center and not do this, the, the sides, or I could do a square on, this, on one side or the other, just based upon where the enemies are positioned on that grid. I here's, it seems to make little sense. It, but here's the thing. I'm, I'm gonna, if, this is the great thing about having chat, having really good things in chat. This, <laughs> this triggered my brain right here. So the the templates and options to rearrange beforehand if you ambush. This is what I'm talking about with a build. Uh, that's a great idea. So there we go. This, this comes back to me talking about why I want abilities to be more in the forefront. Because now if you have a whole new battle set up and a battle, like now you talk about something like ambush. Like ambush may become something that's a really good ability to have because now what you do is you're able to see where they're all lined up per se, and now you have like an advantage, like to that because not only do you get to attack first maybe with ambush. This is why I talk about like leveling up. Maybe ambush one, you get to see where they are on the map, and then ambush no, I, two, you get I'm, to. I'm really, I'm really thankful for whoever suggested that because that pretty much convinces me that the game should have a pre set template of your formation before going to the battle and ambushing you're allowed to change it before the actual battle starts so that the... fixes the problem perfectly yeah and because I... you don't always have to complete so yeah i didn't like having to always change your position in battle because that doesn't make any sense to me you won't the enemies wouldn't allow you to position yourself correctly Yes, yeah, Mr. I- Mr. Ideas. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can see it going in the reverse, too. If your team gets ambushed, then you're randomly placed oh, on, the, on the battlefield. That's, like, that's kind of like Darkest Dungeon, I think, does that. I feel like you get swapped around. I think. It, it, may, it, 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 it may also be that the character that moves into the combat space to initiate the combat may end up being in the front of the combat. Now, so uh, what, what of seeing what Iron Oaks... You know, idea is for how they're going to implement that combat system, but having some way to probably position your team is going to be a thing. The yeah. Question is, the question is, is way. how much is that mechanic going to slow down the gameplay? Because mm-hmm. right now in For the King One, you start a battle, boom, you're in there. It's just instant. There's no delay. And it's a, if, and you it's have, always, if you now have to start a battle and go through this whole process with your with your co-op friends who are not really your friends, they're just randos that you picked up on. It's like, okay, you have to wait for people to choose their spot. 
you know, I want a button that says just randomize it. Yeah, or like just, just do it. You, you get, know, get me through that fast. You get Richard ideas on your team, and he can't figure out um, <laughs> what, when he's going to position himself, and you're just like ready to just log out because you can't even or, get through a battle. Or, or you have a timer so that there's a timer counting down, and you only have five seconds to place yourself on the grid, and then boom, you're in. Yeah. Otherwise, the game just randomly throws you out there. Can I uh, just talk about battles in general? I, you would think that the the timeline, the battle timeline, is probably going to be. They they're not going to change that. Do you think that they're going to mess with that much? Like, do you think it's still going to be a speed based orient? Like, again, I I don't want to harp back on like the speed stats, but do you think it's still going to be like the speed based lineup to where it's going to be? Um, still I think done that. There's, there's a good possibility that they're going to completely abandon their their whole uh, timeline uh, initiative you think mechanic, so. potentially. You think so? And, and the reason why I think that is because all of the release screenshots they gave you, they were purposeful in not showing any UI. mechanical aspect of the game. Yeah, no UI, no user interface stuff was shown on any of those images. Because I have a feeling that they're reworking their ideas on on that. I, but the only thing I don't, I, again, it, games do all different ways of figuring out like what position you're at. I hope they don't just go to cheesy like, like this person goes first, this person goes set, like, and it's always like this set kind of thing. I, I hope they do something still that you're able to like, you know, manipulate it to a certain degree, and you're able to like, you know, position yourself in better spots depending on gear and all that. But I, yeah, I wonder how they're actually going to play that out. So, um, do you, uh, one last thing about the battle, um, and I know this is kind of a tangent, do you think that they should have group reset and group rush type weapons in the next set of games? Well, we're now dealing with a four player team instead of a three player team. If, if rush was already, uh, party rush in particular, was already overpowered, with a three-player team where you're rushing two teammates, imagine if you're rushing three teammates. That's a great point. I, I think you completely have to get rid of party rush. It is okay. way too strong. I would. Okay. And I think party reset is an AOE attack. I think as long as they start you know, restricting how much of that combat grid you're actually able to target, you could probably still work with a, you know, a AOE reset but maybe not be able to get all the enemies because they, you're not able to really select that entire grid. I feel like the other thing they could do with weapons like that, too, is they give you almost like uh, an opportunity to maybe only be able to do it once or twice in a battle. Like, you can't do, like, party rush, like, 3,500 times and just continuously do it to where the, you always win the battle. I wonder if they'll you, do you something. Talk, like, you talking like, 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 about like a cooldown? Right. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like a, a, like a cooldown. A, a, a cooldown cool on an ability of a weapon. A cooldown or just a max you can use in one fight. Um, I mean, you can only use this ability twice in one fight. Or something like that. Um, so then you have to kind of be a little bit more thoughtful about it. And then plus on top of it too, if you don't hit it, then you lose it. So <laughs> Sheldon, the guns are kind of like a cooldown. Yeah. The guns yeah, are like the king that you have to reload. Yeah. Speaking of guns, if there was a, a class that had an ability where you just auto reload without an action, yeah. that would make guns a lot better. <laughs> yes. And I. <laughs> but, by the way, I would think that with the new grid system for their combat, that movement of your character in that grid may be something that you're going to be able to do in battle. That's the one thing is like, how many. Again, so there's all sorts of different games that do this kind of stuff and to speculate, like, are they going to. Is like the front line going to be the tanky line that actually takes it? Like, does it depend like that you have people directly in front of you? Like, there there's a lot of different angles they can take that, and I'm just curious to see what they do with it. I mean, hopefully we I'm, we get I'm an thinking, opportunity you know, to see it early. <laughs> with four, with more than three enemies that you could potentially face, I I mean they showed some screenshots of five enemies in the combat that you're going up against. Yeah. There's more than four, which your party has. If they all targeted the same guy, I mean we already have a problem with you know people getting focused 
down by the enemy. They keep attacking the same character. Imagine if five guys are attacking the same character. If you have a character who ends up really, really hurt, the ability to have them like fall back and have somebody move forward to kind of body block and protect them, I think becomes an actual strategy Yeah, in the combat system. I also feel like that uh, if there were five enemies, like... I feel like if there's someone on the top left front line and there's someone on the enemies on the opposite side corner front line, count they able to hit each other. Like, how, like it, it, it might be a range, a range that you can actually. Be, hit. I think I think there should be either a range or an accuracy penalty trying to hit someone that's farther away. Like trying to hit the other corner front line on your front line. If they're too far away, either you can't do it or there's an accuracy penalty because of the distance. There's, there's actually something that you just brought up, Mike, that actually made me think about something that is another concern of mine. Is like you talked about how there's five enemies on the battlefield, right? How like you saw that in one of the screenshots. Um, like I know sometimes you get unlucky um, on three three v three in FTK one that you end up getting like for some reason you have like a guy that somehow takes all three of the hits, right? Like mm-hmm. what if? All five of them, like, like just some of you just get really unlucky and they all unload on like the same person. I that could be potentially a problem. Because I think Iron Oak is going to have thought of that ahead of time. He probably programmed the code that no one character could ever take more than three hits. I, I would hope so. I would hope so because that yeah. it seems like you would just get totally. Um, yeah, yeah, you could be obliterated before you could even act potentially. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that's going to happen. They're either going to make it impossible to target certain lines, or they're going to lower the accuracy penalties from range. Yeah, they're going to do something to yeah, prevent that. For sure. Okay, anything about the the battle grid uh, before we go to our final question here? Yeah, I think I've pretty much said my piece on <laughs> what it looks like their, their combat system may be. I'm looking forward to seeing it in action and seeing what they have in mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, for sure. I guess that's the whole fun about this is the speculation and what they're going to do with it. So, of of course, you know, uh, Iron Oaks is very talkative and they're very open about all the stuff that they're <laughs> doing. So we, we get a lot of insights into it. <laughs> but it will be cool. I think that's actually kind of a plus to their being very tight-lipped is I think it is going to be so interesting to, like, whenever we get an opportunity to get our hands on it to see kind of how this all plays out. But um, of course, the second thing that we do know that they're going to be doing is there's going to be four players um, in it in lieu of three, which we have now in FTK. And this is yep. actually something that I've been definitely thinking about a little bit um, as of late. And, you know, the one thing that we, I would say that, I mean, I know I do a really, really good job of this, um, and I know you guys do as well too, but like, the pathing aspect to the game. The pathing aspect to the game is, you know, we talked about how important it is to understand focus, but pathing is probably the most critical part of the game to understand. Now, we do a lot of different tricks with, like, dungeon poles and, you know, using teleport scrolls to kind of get across the map quickly, like on Masters Plays. Um, for those of you who are interested, like, I've got an actual a video that I just did it live where I just showed what you do after Glittering Mines. and um, the what I get concerned about with four players is you kind of have a scaling problem, in my opinion. So if you have a situation to where like now you have four, it seems like you have to make the map much bigger. But when you make the map much bigger, you then spread out your players more, which makes it even harder to like fight things together. So like the big thing that you want to do is do a lot of fights where you've got your three guys grouped together. Well. If you have a bigger map, you got to spread four people out to be able to find stuff. Well, then it makes it kind of untenable to be able to, like, fight anything on the overworld because now you're really weak spreading all your guys out. But they can't make the map super, super tiny because at the then it's like you're just kind of all moving together and you, you just are able to utilize, you know, some of the pole mechanics and kind of stuff real easily and you find everything so fast. So I don't know how they're going to scale the map and how they're uh, going to balance that. My ideas on that is, or, or as a way to address that possibility or that issue, um, one of the things I'm noticing about the new game is they have elevation in the overworld. You've got, it's not just a flat 
movement board. Ah, so if you have a cliff that your characters are up against, you can't just go straight at the cliff. You're going to have to go around. So that's really restricting the amount of space that those four characters are actually able to move. They're not able to move in four directions or all directions of the compass. They're, they're kind of forced to move on what the terrain allows them to because it's elevated. I see. I also, so I think that ha- helps a little bit, but I also think there's an opportunity because it's a four player that you can literally create two player uh, teams that work together. You can split the party up. Two players to go do one objective while the other two players go take on another objective. Hmm. So you can actually have a quest where the two objectives have to occur in a certain amount of time. So you you literally have to split up the party and and try to do those in a certain amount of time. I mean, you have options like that within the game to try to create situations where you're not always together during doing battles and you're kind of creating pairs of teams together it Sheldon, do you want yes. to say something? Yeah, the whole splitting thing i mean that's assuming a full party and for the king you could go you could do a game with two people you could do a game with one would the game be unbalanced all of a sudden if you went three or two or or one because you can't get to every location that you need to. That's what's going to be really interesting is how... Because, you know, they set up the uh, the ability to be able to play the game with only two or one. And that seems like the scaling also seems to be kind of a difficult juggling act as well, too, if you do reduce it down to two or one. Um, maybe they're trying to force the game to where you don't play down with a one. Maybe that it just becomes so bad to play with just one hero in the game that it's just not worth it that at least... Maybe they try to find a way to balance it with two. I definitely don't think that they gave the option for one player to have the to have the players decide on the on the on their own. Oh, that one player is not worth it. If the developers already know that, why even have that as an option? Sure. It's like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> they're either they're either gonna have to work on balancing for one player, two player, three player, and four player. Or they're going to have to put restrictions on the number of players minimum and the number of players maximum that you would have in a game. Four is obviously the max. Maybe there's a two-player minimum. I think what you're also going to get, and I think this is one thing that's going to be pretty cool, is I think you're going to get a lot of heroes in the game. If you're going to have four to pick from, because what what do we have right now? Is it 13 in total? Yeah, 13 in total for three, which means if they have four... What are they going to introduce, like 20? 24 well, heroes? We saw that they're going to have uh, like boomerangs and other types of things, so there's probably going to be new classes introduced for sure. I, I, think, for sure. I, I, think, I think I even heard one of the developers in the Discord talk about having really strange weapons that do crazy things. <laughs> like, for example, a guitar bow. Or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. <laughs> you think guitar is pretty like a bow? Yes. Yeah, or something... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it it's kind of interesting because like the 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 four person thing. I'm kind of that that's what definitely one of those things. Where like the two by four battle grid. I'm actually pretty excited for the four person team thing. I'm kind of like more of like hesitant to see how they 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 pull that off because like well, it, it's just it's interesting I, how they scale that. I also feel like you can introduce. Um, horses or wagons uh, or wagons in the game. So like, just like boat movement, where you're moving the entire team on a boat. Sure. You could have a wagon where you're moving the entire team on a wagon. Or a catapult. You just on, shoot on ground, your, or you just right? shoot your team across the map or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or the PSDs, you just shoot with a cannon. Yeah. So they may, they yeah. may make it possible where you could actually pur- purchase <laughs> purchase a. Uh, Something that gives you more movement, sure. like purchase a horse, where that character can can get a lot more movement from that horse and is able to go out and get back to the team. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. Yes. But there's lots of opportunity, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so anything else that you guys want to add on the four-player thing before you kind of wrap this whole thing up real quick? Well, real, real quick, I definitely feel like in For the King 1 that 
you kind of want your party to stick together, which is why the boat was so convenient, because the entire party moves all at once in a boat. Like, it seems like the game is just harder if you split your party up to, like, actual do combats and stuff. Like, splitting up the, search out the map, that seems to be, like, the only good use of splitting up your party. Otherwise, you want to stick together. But if you're going to stick together, having everyone move individually, constantly, is just like, ugh. I think... I, I th- I think, though, that's my concern, though, is, like, okay. because in order to do that, you probably need to make the map even bigger, which would make it to where you can't walk around. Like, it, it, they'll, they have to make it too big, so then the horse or the wagon or whatever it is isn't then easily just, like, can make two moves and it's across the entire map. So that's what my concern is. It's, <laughs> it's just that I'm sure they are... Why they test it and develop it and go through it and it's like they and this kind of brings me to a larger point like i was really wanting them to make a new game because i think iron oaks did such a hell of a job with ftk1 i I, like i i think they did amazing with ftk1 and you know i just personally wanted to see a new game but with ftk2 i'm just i'm curious to see what they do with these changes like wh- how much do they how far do they go outside like do they do the whole thing where they scrap focus and they really change up like how the game mechanic is i'm not saying that's a good idea or a bad idea i'm just saying like i'm just fascinated to see what they take with this because of course they're tight-lipped they had the ui turned off and all they're like you get four heroes in a two by four grid that's all we're going to show you guys for right now and so it's it's going to be very interesting where they take this thing, for sure. Another thing I noticed about the trailer, I mean, the, not the trailer, the, uh, the screenshots, it's probably meaningless. It's just a nice little thing I noticed is there's a big chunk of forest. Like, big chunk of forest that you actually see. Like, in For the King 1, every empty hex is always touching some other unaccessible hex. So, for example, in, in the Guardian Forest, if there's a hex you can stand on, Almost every single uh, hex adjacent to it, other than a path, there's a random tree, right? There's not there's hardly ever a cluster of anything. Mm-hmm. I noticed in uh, the, the screenshots, there's clusters of forest. I don't know if that means anything at all, or if that's just a, a, a nice art look or whatever, but mm-hmm. that means it's a bigger map. Yeah, I found that interesting. Yeah. Maybe the, uh, it, could also, it could also be a... An interesting way to hide something, like I don't know, there's a way to actually go into the cluster of forest. Yeah, like it's just kind of weird why there's a big cluster of forest literally in the map, not on the side of the map, but well, in the map. You know, interesting. In For the King One, you had a biome like the bog where your movement is slowed when you're walking yeah. through that terrain, but that was based on the biome. What if they don't do that kind of thing based on biomes, but they just do it based on the actual hex itself? So the hex is full of bushes. That that hex is slower to move through. It like, takes additional movement points to move through it, or something like that. Who knows what they're going to come up with? I know, and that that's the thing. Is is I didn't want to go too crazy with this podcast because I definitely want to be able to see some stuff first before we probably expand on this as well. But like my brain went in crazy directions too. Like, what if they add like ten biomes? Like it's kind of like what they do is they mash like all of the DLCs together to where you have like a frozen biome up north and then there's like I uh, like they just make this where it's like a massive world. But what it is is like every single game is no longer one single storyline. It's kind of like what Lost Civ did to a much larger scale is you could take two different paths, right? I I mean they could make this to where now with four people, you could what if there's multiple paths that you can go? Maybe the first time you play you take the Vexer's Tower path and then like the second time you play it, it's like you go and do I know Vexer is not supposed to be there. It's we're talking about FTK one, but like they just do these different paths and the map is almost like a giant world and makes it like a really big, like continuous, like fun like new challenge every single time i've thought of this i've even posted it in the suggestion box about branching paths mm-hmm. like i think like they're, like it'd be cool if there was like a way to a path where you side with rosmond and you're up against the rebel hillbrand <laughs> or vice versa you're you're with hellbrand and you're trying to overthrow the queen or you could choose to be good if you have that other path 
Yeah. <laughs> you either uh, side with Hildebrand or you side with Queen Walzerma. Yeah. I, I feel like yeah. I feel like Sheldon. I think like Sheldon would rather pick the middle road so he can kill them both, so he can prove a point that he's yeah, the he best. Kill everything. Yeah. There was a few way waste the whole fall rules. You're just a, yeah. You are now the new ruler of chaos. Like you replace Vexer as the ruler of chaos. You just wreck the world. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think I think this is a good point to leave it here. And I, I think pretty much the big next step is, um, you know, what we're probably the three of us are hoping for is uh, hopefully some type of like early release, maybe some it would be kind of cool to kind of like get an opportunity to see it before they completely fully uh, send it out. Would Hopefully we can get an opportunity to like do something to where we can um you know, give some feedback before they do the full release. I, I know almost every single game now um, ends up having, you know, they do pre-releases on everything now. I mean, how long has Valheim been out <laughs> pre-released at this point before it's even actually been fully released? But it'd be cool to kind of see where they end up bringing this. And the next time that they do something like that, hopefully we can do another podcast and then expand upon what Mr. direction Mr. Math, Mr. Math, good job, my friend. Yes. Mr. Math, beating the game. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I, I'm looking at the other screen. It's weird. I've got a weird setup in the hotel room. I've got the TV screen as my second screen. So um, thank you guys uh, so much for joining. Um, I am going to be completely back doing FTK two guides. And Sheldon, I will make sure to do you proud to not talk about the herbalist so much on my very first video for FTK two. I will do a much better job this time around and it'll be much more polished um thank you sheldon thank you mike for joining me today um on today's stream i will definitely have you guys back thank you to richard and tokor and mr math for just showing up at the last second uh thank you guys so much for being a part of it and kira as well too um it's been a pleasure having you guys all on and we will see you guys again later Bye bye <laughs>